Will you please look at this picture and then tell me what it is and what it represents? Now, what is this picture and what does it represent? Okay, if you said the first, flag, first object was a flag and it represented the United States of America, then you're absolutely right. Now, if you said the second picture was also a flag and it represents Canada, you're batting a perfect 1,000. Now, please look closely at this flag and tell me the very first thing that enters your mind. All right, now, if you're familiar with the international flag code, the solid red flag would mean simply the second letter in the alphabet, B. But to the average person, a red flag signals danger. Now, we use the term a red flag as a metaphor to tell us that something's wrong or there's a real danger, don't we? Well, let me tell you the amazing things that have led up to us producing this particular video about a red flag waving. Recently, we were out on the west coast of the United States and on a speaking engagement. And a well-dressed, uh, soft-spoken Adventist who obviously was very sincere gave me a pamphlet of about 36 pages. As Dee and I were driving home, I laid down in the back seat and started to glance through that little book. Well, it wasn't long before I was completely entranced. I read it through twice. Then I climbed over into the passenger seat next to Dee and I read it to her. Now, she was as stunned as I was with this well-investigated and highly documented exposure of a fabulous false doctrine that's been accepted by probably uh, more than 99% of all professed Christians. Now, what was so startling about this revealing disclosure was the fact that I had also accepted this counterfeit teaching when I was a pastor back in a Sunday-keeping denomination. I, it was so widely believed that even after becoming an Adventist, I never, ever questioned its biblical truthfulness. Now, when you discover that a certain so-called doctrine is actually a pagan concept, do you see this? Sure you do. And if by some strange chance you don't, you sure ought to. Okay, we came home and couldn't get that plain spoken pamphlet out of our minds we started our own personal investigation of the claims and charges in that soul-gripping publication. Now, uh, my wife reads almost as much as I do, but I've never seen her so absorbed in any subject as she's been in this. I've seen her read, stop, go look up something in a Greek or, or Hebrew lexicon, and then go back and continue right on reading. She and I have been searching the Bible in the spirit of prophecy as never before in our entire lives. And then... We experienced four strange conversations that took place in four consecutive days. Now, the first one was between Dee and me. When I saw where some of my history books and encyclopedias revealed that this false doctrine just happens to be the one most important doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, I turned to Dee and I said, hey, that ought to raise a red flag immediately in people's minds. Then, the very next day, she and I drove over 150 miles to another state to have lunch with a, a precious and very solid married couple that we're privileged to call dear friends and fellow believers. Now, we appreciate this dedicated couple's deep spirituality so much, we wanted to run this startling subject by them to see if they were aware of it. Now, they were aware of it, all right. And then what he said sort of made me feel strange. He said, when you realize that it's pagan and actually one of the papacy's cardinal doctrines, it ought to raise a red flag right before you. And then the day after that, I was talking with a dedicated Adventist in British Columbia. Now, this godly layman told me that he'd become discouraged over the fact that most independent ministers were preaching basically the same things they were years ago. And then he said that maybe their wrong concept of this vital doctrine was the very why the Lord wasn't really using them to finish the work. 
And then the day after that, the fourth day in a row, I got another call from a, a sincere man in Colorado. Now, this man of the word told me that he'd come to the conclusion that the church's acceptance of this falsehood is the very reason why we aren't rejoicing in heaven with the Lord right now. And then he reminded me of a very familiar statement from the pen of inspiration. You remember this. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to receive them as his own. Now listen, I got cramps in my stomach when he went on to say, there's absolutely no way for a person to develop a character like Christ when he or she is accepting a false satanic concept of one of the most important doctrines in God's Word. And then he added, and there's no independent ministry that I know of right now who's going to truly give the loud cry when it's believing and teaching this blasphemous doctrine the majority of Adventists have accepted and believed. Let me tell you something. When you have four conversations like those in four days, you've got to believe that the Lord's trying to impress you with the seriousness and the sacredness of it all. And I'll admit, man, I was scared. In the fifth volume of the Testimonies, God's inspired prophet said something about the whole world willingly accepting the wrong concepts and creeds that, that you've got to honestly admit is being fulfilled to the very letter today. On page 477, we're told this. The voice of Satan is so disguised that it is accepted as the voice of God. Within the past few years, we've tried to reconsider and re-examine the three angels' message many times to make sure that our understanding of, of truth hasn't been altered in any way. Now, we've had to come face to face with the fact that an alarming number of our precious God-given, God-inspired doctrines and standards have been relaxed and revised and, or rejected. And so when you run across something as startling as that little brochure, you can't throw it away or just set it aside as, a, as another way out concept. You've just got to check it out thoroughly, and we've done just that. We've tried very prayerfully and very carefully to learn what God's inspired Word does tell us about this eternally essential concept. Will you please look at something that Frederick Wilhelm Neitzig wrote in 1878. Now please look long and hard because this philosophical gem is going to bear down on us longer and harder than you might think. Every tradition grows more venerable, more revered. The reverence due to it increases from generation to generation the tradition finally becomes holy and inspires all. Now, what we're going to consider is a tradition. It's a, it's a teaching that has no biblical foundation whatsoever, and yet most of us have held it as true and scriptural ever since we became uh, Christians. And maybe I ought to tell you that I was mortified when I realized that this doctrine isn't scriptural. I felt like I did when I, when I discovered that, that Sunday wasn't the Lord's day. Now, I believe that you're just as sincere, maybe even more so. And in your sincerity and, and earnestness, you've probably never, ever even questioned it either. But what hurts so much is the fact that there has been a deliberate, long-range propaganda program to get the Seventh-day Adventist denomination to accept this false substitute theory along with all the fallen Protestant churches. Something so crucial as this satanic campaign to deceive God's true people just doesn't happen by accident. And in order to come to an honest, full, and complete understanding of this tradition that's been become holy and revered, we're going to have to, to really examine a lot of facts. Now, examining all the facts in itself can't give you an understanding of the truth. And neither will it change or improve your life. 
something's got to be done before you can grasp the truth about this terrible tradition that's been accepted by some of the brightest lights in and out of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Do you know what you're going to have to do to see the real spiritual significance in all this? In Review and Herald, page 368, the second Review and Herald, the pit of inspiration tells you exactly what you're going to have to do right now. You must lay yourself and your opinions on the altar of God. Put away your preconceived ideas and let the Spirit of Heaven guide you into all truth. And since we want to make absolutely sure we understand exactly what our Heavenly Father wants us to grasp about this tremendous subject, we're not going to rush through the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. We can't leave any stone unturned in our search for solid truth. So we're going to divide this tremendous study into several parts. Now, I'd like to recommend that you stop at the end of each part, take a short break, refresh yourself, and then come back to the next part. Now, this is so crucial that you can't possibly miss one iota, one teeny, tiny, microscopic segment of this study. Now, I don't know how I can impress you too much with the necessity of your absorbing what we're about to present. Now, maybe you'll be interested in knowing that this super important doctrine, the true one now, not the altered concept, was accepted fully by the Seventh-day Adventist denomination from its very outset from its very beginning. You'd also be interested in learning the fact that Ellen White believed and taught it, but her funeral services weren't hardly over before a certain enemy force began its insidious work to counteract her influence. Now, if you knew that one of the most active workers in passing this satanic substitute on to the rank and file of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was the very one who was successful in getting the entire membership, practically, to accept the falsehood of Satan, of Christ's nature, being taught today in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Would you automatically then see? When you discover that the powerful indoctrination that was carried on to establish this blasphemous era was done by some of the very same people who denied some of God's original truths for his last day people in order to be accepted by the fallen evangelical churches of the world, what do you see? Now listen, if there's even the most remote possibility that this altered false concept can actually prevent your being a real tangible part of the 144,000, you'd be studying this out like Dee and I have been doing day and night. We've already run head on uh, with a couple of folks both in the Seventh-day Adventist structure and out of it who've accepted this altered concept and who were very volatile over any hint that they might be wrong. It seems that this uh, counterfeit substitute for the truth has been entrenched so deeply that the largest majority of Adventists still cling tenaciously to it and refuse to consider any other view whatsoever. All right, now listen, since, since there are such monumental and eternal consequences hanging on whether or not you grasp the, the full and complete truth, we're going to do something we have never done before on any of our, of our videos. We're going to stop for about 30 seconds and let you ask the Lord right where you are to allow you to fully open your mind to the leading of His Spirit. Now, it doesn't matter what words you use. Please, please ask him to allow you to set aside any and all preconceived ideas and give you the truth. Will you pray as we focus in on some flowers for the next 30 seconds? Please ask him to let you see if what we present is 100% correct. Will you please pray?
Okay. Let's investigate the facts. It's hard to find an Adventist who doesn't know John 14, 1 through 3. You know, where Jesus told the disciples about all the mansions in heaven. Well, this sort of puzzled his 12 followers. And finally, Philip asked the Lord to do something that every sincere Christian at, at one time or another has wished the Lord to do for him or her. Philip asked Jesus to show them what the Heavenly Father looks like. Do you remember what Jesus said? Do you remember his reply? In that same 14th chapter of John in verse 9, we see what Jesus said to him and all the rest of the disciples. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. For lots of folks, this isn't quite enough. They'd like to have more information about God. And what the Bible does tell us about God's going to lay down some explosives that are really going to blast us, the century-old false tradition, into a million pieces. What do we really know about God? Now, the answers from God's own revelation to us, the Holy Scriptures, we find some answers that, that, that you've got to let sink deep into your consciousness. First, God has more than one sphere of existence. A number of times, humans have been given partial glimpses of the supreme being. On several occasions, God's peeled back that mysterious curtain and, and let a few of his faithful creations get some valuable information about him. In Daniel chapter 7, we read about uh, tremendously important visions that, that ancient prophet Daniel was given. But in verse 9, we might see the familiar passage a new way. This is what it says. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, set in place, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Now, and of course, this is God, okay? Look at what else Daniel tells us about God. Whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. That was Daniel chapter 7, and verse 9. Now, Daniel got a glimpse of God in some type of bodily form, didn't he? Okay? Ezekiel had one of those highest of high privileges too. Now please notice very carefully what this man of God said about his God and, and yours and mine. In the very first chapter of his book and in the very first verse, he said that he saw visions of God. Then in the 26th verse, he reveals this. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Now, Ezekiel was allowed to see a glimmer of God, just enough to know that he, he looked sort of like a human being. Now, how many times have you read or, or heard those familiar words of Isaiah's vision of God? In the sixth chapter, Isaiah gives this report in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. Now, you know that no man's ever seen God in his fullness and, and in all his glory. But the scriptures do tell us that they were allowed to behold enough to recognize a form and a shape. Now, now didn't John the Revelator also see God sitting on a throne in heaven? And once, didn't he see God holding a book that was sealed with seven seals? And then what these things are revealing to us about the Father, what are they? It lets us know that one of God's fears of existence is anatomical. In other words, one of, the, of, of God's fear of existence is on the physical, visible, physical level. Now, you can grasp that, can't you? One phase of God's operations allowed others to learn he has some type of a bodily form and shape. Look at the book of Revelation again and see how clear this is made. In the fourth chapter, there's unquestionable proof that God's actually on the throne in a visible, tangible way. Look at verses 10 and, and 11. Here's what you find, find recorded there. 
the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, now, before you start to say, I've always thought they were praising Jesus because he created our world. Well, look again at the last part of that 11th verse. Notice what it says. For thou hast created all things. Now, when it says all things, that's exactly what it means. All the universe, all the angels, and all the inhabitants of all those other worlds. In the 8th verse, you find the four beasts worshiping and thanking the one who sat on the throne too. Okay? Look at how they address that person on the throne. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now, did they see God as they thanked him? Was God visible to them when they worshiped him? Was God in some physical fashion when they declared him holy? Of course. God was in his anatomical sphere. He was visible. God has a divine form that makes it possible under certain circumstances now for some worshipers and some workers to see him. And God's physical features are beheld by those surrounding the throne. Look at, isn't this what Jesus was revealing to us when he said what he did in John 5:37? And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Now, the second sphere of God's existence is just the opposite. Sometimes God's existence is on a spiritual sphere. In other words, one of God's sphere of existence is invisible. One phase of God's operation doesn't allow others to see him. Now, this was brought out very plainly by Jesus in the fourth chapter of John. Remember these words in the 24th verse? God is a spirit. Now, our Heavenly Father's an infinite spirit being. He, he isn't subject to the same limitations like you and I are. We're finite beings. God doesn't always work on the visible level. Now, we'll see more of this overwhelming fact a little later, but let's establish the fact that God's the ever-present, all-powerful, all-knowing Spirit, and He reaches out far beyond the material form you and I are limited to do. So we can establish one critical truth about our Heavenly Father. God operates on two spheres, two levels, the invisible and the invisible, the visible and the invisible. I don't know if I got that backwards or not. With those facts in mind, let's look at what God's revealed to us about himself and his word. When one of the scribes came to Jesus to ask him which is the first or, or the most important commandment of the ten, what did Jesus say? In Mark 12, 29, Jesus replied by quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4. And as he gave his reply, he opened, an, uh, opened up an overwhelming truth. Look at it. And Jesus answered him, and the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. When the Lord finished his answer, do you remember what the scribe said? Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. Jesus said that his heavenly Father is one, singular, and the scribe said he was correct. When Jesus was praying that dynamic prayer that's been recorded in the 17th chapter of John, he made almost the same declaration. Now, please notice the message Jesus was giving to us in the third verse. And this is life eternal, 
that they may know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. Jesus called His heavenly Father the only true God, and He made a distinction between Himself and the only true God, didn't He? Jesus didn't refer to Himself as God, did He? When the rich young ruler came to Jesus to find out what he could do to, to inherit eternal life, he didn't call him by his earthly given name. In Matthew chapter 19, we see how he addresses the Lord. In verses 16 and 17, we have his greeting and Christ's somewhat stunning reply. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good Master. Now, what did he call the Lord? Sure, Good Master. And what was, what was Christ's response? He, Jesus, said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. Now, <laughs> this might sound uh, like a stupid question, but please answer it anywhere. If a couple means two, how many does one mean? <laughs> You're probably thinking, why ask such a question? One, one, and it can't be any more. Webster defines the three-letter word one this way. One, being a single unit or thing, being one in particular. Now notice how this was open up the, this was what the opening uh, salvo from Mount Sinai was like. You remember when the children of Israel had, had been in deep, deep uh, sun worship, uh, right in the middle of it for 400 years in Egypt. When they stood before God that monumental day, he wanted to deal with one of the most insidious falsehood ever fostered on mankind. Remember he said this first and foremost, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now I'm going to leave this famous passage up on the screen a little longer and ask you to tell me what's the very last word in that quote. Sure, it's me, singular. Look closer now and make sure it doesn't say us plural. It doesn't, does it? No. It says me. You remember, don't you, how Satan used Nimrod and his wife Samarimus, along with Tammuz or Tammuz, whichever way you want to pronounce it, to establish his counterfeit pagan religion of sun worship? Well, Satan also got those pagans to revere Nimrod, Samarimus, and Tammuz as gods. And later, Satan inspired heathen men to worship them as a divine trio. So God told those Hebrews at the foot of Mount Sinai that day they, that they had one God and one God only. Now, as you know, the Hebrew people didn't obey God and had to wander in, in the desert for 40 years. Before Moses died, he gathered the people together and he spoke to them like a father to his children. In the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses tells them that there's only one way they can have a long, happy, and prosperous life. In verses 4 and 5, he says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Our Heavenly Father is supposed to get the major portion of our affections and emotions, isn't he? Our, our minds are, are supposed to be turned to Him the majority of the time, aren't they? And we're supposed to love Him and serve Him in the highest degree possible, aren't we? And what time you don't spend dwelling on His love, you're supposed to think of Christ's love and sacrifice. Okay, you know that, don't you? then why are we commanded to have no other gods before or in the place of God the Father? Why are we told to give Him all our uh, emotions, affections, love, and service? Why? Well, Jesus gave us the answer in no uncertain terms in that 17th chapter of John we looked at. Now, please notice what He says is the real motive for God being supreme in our lives. Remember what He said in verse 3? And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. 
Eternal life hangs on your concept of God and your acceptance of Him, doesn't it? In other words, it's more than a life and death proposition. It's living eternally or never existing ever again. Never. But please notice that Jesus not only says that His Father is God, He's the only true God. Now Moses tried and he tried to get the chosen people of God to recognize this fact. When he was telling them that he wasn't going to go over into the promised land with them, he stressed the necessity of their grasping the truth about the highest being in all the universe. Now there's absolutely no way for a sane and sensible human being to misunderstand what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at what God impressed him to state in verses 33 through 35. He asked this question. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and live? Or hath God assayed or, or undertaken to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, trials, by signs and by wonders and by war and by a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm and by great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, He is God. There is none else beside Him. And then in the 39th verse, He really tries to drive it deep into their hearts and minds. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, He is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. Apparently the Apostle Paul understood what Moses was trying to teach the people back in the wilderness. He tried to impress the people of Corinth and you and me with this great truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul's explanation is very clear and right to the point. Look at his direct statement in verse 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things and we by Him. Now, about 11 years after Paul had written uh, that to those uh, Corinthian uh, Christians, he wrote two letters to the young and promising pastor Timothy. In the very first chapter of his, his first letter to Timothy, Paul releases his heartfelt love for his heavenly Father. And what he says is for a divine purpose, and, and we'll see it in a few minutes. In verse 17, Paul makes this declaration. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. And then, excuse me, just a few verses later, you see why Paul said what he did earlier. Paul wanted to remind Timothy of something he'd known for years. Look at what he told the youthful man of God about God in chapter 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. By the time Timothy was taking the gospel to the world, the Greeks had already been worshipped some strange characters they called God. The Christians in Ephesus face the same concepts of many gods, false gods too. So Paul wrote to them also and stressed again the truth. In Ephesians 4, he stressed one word over and over again. Look at what he said in chapter 4 and verses 4 through 6 and see if you can spot that crucial word. There is one body and one spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, 
one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Paul was a southern man, wasn't he? In you all. Now, all these biblical statements about God are found in the spirit of prophecy writings too. But I think that the best description is the one in volume 8 of the testimony. On page 220, this is what the pen of inspiration wrote. The everlasting God. In the word, God is spoken of as the everlasting God. This name embraces past, present, and future. God is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the eternal one, singular. Now, before you start asking, why is he giving us all these texts about God when we know him well, full well? Well, let me ask you to look at something very crucial in the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. On page 106, this instruction is given after she quotes the first part of Christ's famous example of perfect prayer. Hallowed be thy name, Matthew 6, 9. To hallow the name of the Lord requires that the words in which we speak of the supreme being be uttered with reverence. Holy and reverent is his name, Psalm 111, 9. We are never in any manner to treat lightly the names of and appellations of the deity. In prayer, we enter the audience chamber of the Most High, and we should come before Him with holy awe. The angels veil their faces in His presence. The cherubim and the bright and holy seraphim approach His throne with solemn reverence. How much more should we, finite sinful beings, come in a reverent manner before the Lord, our Maker? Do you know why we've been looking at all these quotes and statements? In order for you to grasp the tremendous significance of this widely accepted false but clever counterfeit, we've got to establish a much-needed fact, and that is our Heavenly Father is the one supreme being in the universe. He is the source from which comes all life and power. And this is why Ellen White could write what she did and the reason why she did write what she did in Patriots and Prophets, page 305. Jehovah, the eternal self-existence uh, un created one, himself the source and sustainer of all, is alone entitled to supreme reverence and worship. Our Heavenly Father stands foremost throughout the entire universe. He's unsurpassed. He's the, the major majesty. He's the paramount, the utmost, the preeminent, the sovereign. Listen. This is so much more essential to your relationship to him than you might have ever, ever imagined. You've never imagined how important it is. And you're going to see this, and you're going to see why this is so before this video is over. Now, please let me suggest that you take a break right here, because we're going to start looking at some pretty deep things in our search for truth. And it might be good if, if you could hit the... the uh, stop button in a few seconds and then stand up and, and stretch or, or refresh yourself. You might be in a much better mental frame to grasp all that we're going to look at. But before we pause, let's look once again at a vital summary of what we've been thinking about so far. Our Heavenly Father is the foremost being in all the universe. He's the one supreme being, and from him comes all life and power.
We've seen plainly that the Bible tells us that God the Father is the supreme being above and over all other beings in all the universe. We've also discovered that our Heavenly Father is the only true God, period. Maybe it might be very worthwhile to look at a statement made by James White in one of his Review and uh, Herald articles uh, before we move on to the second vital portion of this very uh, crucial video. What James White said was echoed by all the early pioneers, including his wife. You know, when I read some of the lame reasoning of, of some folks who've been taken in by this slick spiritual maneuvering to prove that this counterfeits all biblical like uh, uh, Ellen White didn't agree with her peers. And I, I can't help but remember how she always rebuked error, uh, even with the uh, famous doctor, and she surely didn't hold back with her, with her husband either. Anyway, here's the early pioneer's view in just ten words. The Father is the greatest in that he is the first. That's from the Review and Herald uh, 224 by James White. Now, now she, she didn't ever disagree or rebuke him either. Now, what we're going to look at is very difficult because we've been programmed over and over again without our even being slightly aware of it. Notice I said we, okay? But since we've got to make absolutely, positively sure that, that all we believe is 100% biblical, and also, our interpretations completely without a flaw, we're going to prayerfully analyze the facts. What we're going to determine now is, is what's our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's position in the government of God? Strangely enough, God's already given us the answer to that question in just one New Testament statement. You find it in the third chapter of Matthew. And the record's given in the, third, in the 16th and 17th verses, and they go like this. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, please tell me, who did God say Jesus is? Sure, he's God's son. Now, I've got six children. Two of them are, are young men who are my uh, own blood. Rightfully, I can say that they're my sons, can I? Now, e even though there's a, a great deal of difference quality-wise, is this what the Bible is telling us? Is Jesus a product of his heavenly Father? Now, please look at what God's Word tells us about Christ's true relationship to God. Probably one of the most familiar and most uh, quoted verses in the Bible is John 3, 16. Now, before you start to quote it, look at the first part of that verse again in light of this crucial subject we're analyzing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, watch this now, begotten Son. Now, let me make it crystal clear. We're not in any way trying to lower in the least the holy solemnity of such a subject as God and His Son. Now, this is one of the highest of, of human themes a, a human can explore. It's so sacred. So, so don't think now we're putting divinity down on the level of humanity. We're simply trying to get our finite minds to think on higher, more sublime terms. But... We just read where Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Now, in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we have Faith Hall of Fame. You know that, don't you? Well, now, please notice something very, very important in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only, what? Begotten Son son. Now, is there a similarity? I mean, even though it's, it's minute and it's almost inconsequential, is there a similarity? Is there an actual similarity between Abraham and Isaac and God and Jesus Christ? Now, both were fulfillment of a promise, weren't they? But did Christ ever become God's son? 
like Isaac became Abraham? Now, before you start to answer that, please look at something interesting Christ himself said. It's found in the fifth chapter of John, and it'll make you start asking some other questions. Look at what Jesus said in the 26th verse. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now, this is going to sound very elementary, but tell me, how did Jesus have life in himself? Sure, it was given to him by his heavenly Father. Now, could it be safe to say then, that Christ didn't originate life in himself? Christ didn't bring himself into being, did he? God's Word tells us that God the Father gave life to Christ. So the Father was the giver and Jesus the recipient. Now this is fantastic. God gave his Son life. Jesus didn't borrow it. Jesus was made the source of life just as the Father is the source of life. He didn't have to derive it. He could bestow it just like his Father could. He could give life exactly as his Father could, and he could create like God the Father creates. But the same life the Father had himself was given by the Father to his Son. Now, this is why Ellen White has written that much repeated statement that's recorded on page 530 of Desire of Ages. Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and life. In Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Now, in that same fifth chapter of John in verse 30, our Lord gives us some additional information that you've just got to consider. What Jesus says in about himself is, is, is uh, just 35 words that are absolutely revealing. Now look at this. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Now to be fair now, you've got to admit that this sort of sounds like our Lord's definitely a loving, obedient son carrying out his father's desires, doesn't it? You know, the Lord spoke a great deal about obedience, didn't he? He knew firsthand what true and willing obedience is because he is the epitome of it. Now, let's read on in that fifth chapter of John. In verse 36, Jesus continues on to tell us more about him and his heavenly father. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me. That the Father hath sent me. Now, Christ was a perfect example of perfect obedience. And all through that chapter, he says he does exactly what his Father does. He says his Father's shown him, given him, and sent him. And that sure does appear to be one person directing and helping and guiding another, doesn't it? Okay? In the 8th chapter of John, Jesus met some real uh, cruel critics head on. I mean, they were actually blasphemous in their accusations. And I believe it really hurt our, our Lord and Savior's heart, too. Well, now, look at the conversation between Jesus and those wicked Jews in verses 31, I mean, verses 41 and 42. Jesus says, you are ye, do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. See what their accusations were. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, 
If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Now, you'd be interested in knowing that this word proceeded forth in its original Greek means to issue forth or to have issued from. In the 14th chapter of John, our Lord says something about his departure from this world and his return back again. Please look at an explosive statement that he makes in verse 28. You have heard how I said to you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. Honestly now, doesn't this sound like Jesus is next in authority to God the Father? Jesus possesses all the characteristics, all the traits, all the attributes, and all the qualities of the deity. He's the Son of God. And in this way, he's equal to his Father. Nevertheless, there's a definite and distinct demarcation line between Father and Son. Possibly the best explanation of it in the Bible is found in what Christ said of himself. Now, will you look at, uh, with me at these uh, royally relevant verses, and we'll go right through them. Jesus saith unto them, My meat or my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I can do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doth the work. In the divine program and government of God, there's an unmistakable chain of command. And unquestionably, God, our Heavenly Father, reigns supreme. And our Lord Jesus Christ stands in a close second position of willing and loving cooperation, collaboration, and concurrence. This is how they're coexisting, living together. Now let me stop here and, and tell you something. I know this may be hard uh, for some of you right now. I mean, it's difficult to completely comprehend this until you've seen all inspiration has revealed to us. So please stay with us. Stay with us until we've seen the total picture. Okay? Speaking of pictures, <laughs> the first chapter of Hebrews sure does give us a beautiful and fascinating portrayal of one of the, the most magnificent and, and majestic scenes taking place in heaven that human beings have ever been allowed to hear about. Now look at this terrific story. God, who at sundry times and divers manners, spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now please watch this. Whom he uh, hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world who being the brightness of his glory, that's God's pride and joy, and the express image of his person looking exactly like his father, when he, Jesus, had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, now stop here for a second. 
Let the, the full realization of what you just saw and heard sink in. There came a definite point in time when God brought forth his son. Way, way back in eternity, Michael became God's only begotten son one beautiful historic day. Therefore, there was a time, <laughs> even though it might be impossible for us to even think back that far into the past, there was a time when Christ wasn't in existence. I, I, it's perfectly hard to perceive, but it's a fact. Okay? Now let's go on and see more of this amazing story. Continuing on with asking the question if God ever said uh, certain things to any of the angels, this question's asked. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the firstborn into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. At a very specific time, God the Father stood his Son, Christ Jesus, right beside him and told all the angels that now Christ was to be worshipped just like himself. Now this is proclaiming Christ Jesus as deity and worthy of worship and adoration. Therefore, there was a time before Christ was sanctified, set up in part as an equal divinity. And the eighth verse makes this clear. But unto his son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. It'll last forever. Now you can see this written out so beautifully in the January 9th edition of Signs of the Times. Look at this. The great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with his, the father, and the heavenly throng of angels was gathered round about them. The father then made it known that it was ordained by himself that Christ should be equal with himself, so that wherever was the presence of his son, it was as, the pre as his own presence. His word was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. His son he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host. Now, now I said a moment ago that at a very specific time this special investment of Christ took place. In the next few sentences you'll see exactly when this all took place. And this is so crucial to grasp and I'll tell you why in a few moments. Now please look and learn exactly when Christ was placed before the angels and given this special confirmation. Especially was he, Christ, to work in union with himself, God, in the anticipated, the look forward to, creation of the earth and every living thing that should exist upon it. So, when was this? Of course, it was before the creation of this earth. It was before God's Son came to earth as our Savior. Now let's read on and see further proof of that. His Son would carry out His will and His purpose, but would do nothing of Himself alone. The Father's will would be fulfilled in Him. It's an undeniable fact now that this happened before our little world was created. Okay, then, what we read next, also very, very important to you and your understanding of this tremendous theory. Satan was jealous and envious of Jesus Christ. Yet, when all the angels bowed to to uh, Jesus to acknowledge his supremacy and high authority and rightful rule, 
Satan bowed with them, but his heart was filled with envy and hatred. Now, please watch this. Christ had been taken into counsel with his Father in regards to his plans while Satan was unacquainted with them. He did not understand, neither was he permitted to know the purposes of God. But Christ was acknowledged sovereign of heaven. His power and authority to be the same as that of God himself. One of the reasons I wanted you to look carefully at this is that there's a theory floating around by, by some very fine and, and otherwise knowledgeable folks that Jesus didn't become the Son of God until after he became incarnate. But this statement Ellen White just made couldn't possibly be any clearer. And when you add this statement of inspiration to what we read a few moments ago in Hebrews 1, we know that Christ was acknowledged as God's Son and next in, a, in command to God before this earth was created, before Satan was cast out, and before Christ came to this earth to be our Savior. But the other reason that you just had to see this quote from Hebrews and this statement from the Spirit of Prophecy is to prove that Christ was one day ordained as a part of divinity. Now look, he wasn't always worshipped, but there came a definite time when God ordained that Jesus be worshipped just like himself. That's why the pen of inspiration says what she does in Sons and Daughters, page 58. Remember this? The Father and the Son alone are to be exalted. You know, it's amazing how we can read the Bible time after time after time, and then all of a sudden have an old familiar passage just jump out at us, and we grasp the real meaning of it for the first time. Now, you've done that, haven't you? Well, there's a passage in the Old Testament that's almost a perfect parallel to the account we read in Hebrews chapter 1. Now, I don't know how many times I've read this, and yet I never grasped the stupendous meaning of it until just lately. Now, before we examine this particular biblical account, will you please look at what's been said in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary about it. Now, this is not from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is the editors and the authors and the compilers of the commentary, and they say this. This passage is allegorical, it's symbolic. And caution must be exercised not to press an allegory beyond what the original writer had in mind. Then it goes on to say that you can't prove by these verses that there was a time when Christ was not in existence and that he was brought forth by the Father. This particular passage is Proverbs 8, and it is talking about the same glorious event we saw in Hebrews 1. Hey, don't take my word for it. Look at the inspired proof that it's talking about Jesus Christ or, or Michael, and here's one solid confirmation in Patriots and Prophets. It's page 34, and it reads this way. What we're going to look at is the Son of God declares concerning himself. And she quotes the Bible verses in Proverbs 8 that we're going to look at. So it's Christ talking about himself, okay? Even without the spirit of prophecy clearly giving us this additional information, you can stigger, still figure out that it's Jesus or Michael in this 8th chapter of Proverbs. But I believe that she was inspired to write that so that it would erase any and all doubts. Now let's look at it. It's really amazing. Here's this Bible text. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before the works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. 
when there were no fountains abounding in water, with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep, or the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as, watch this, one brought up with him. I was daily his delight rejoicing always before him. Proverbs 8, 22 to 30. In all the Holy Scriptures,